The God Who Speaks, number one of three. How Catholics Read the Bible, with Father Guy de Gainsford. All our bishops want us to return to the Word of God, the sacred texts, to read them more prayerfully and to be changed by what we read. Now I'd like to just give you a visual image of that in your minds. Um, it's from 2 Samuel chapter 6. King David has just been anointed the king of all 12 tribes. He's just captured the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites who'd held it, big battle. He's just also defeated two armies of Philistines who have come marching up to put this cocky young upstart in his place. And he's defeated them both. He is powerful, he is wealthy, he is now becoming famous. But David is not happy, he's not content. What he does, he goes straight away from Jerusalem to an obscure village about nine miles to the west of Jerusalem called Deir el Azar. And he goes there because that, this little village, is where the Ark of the Covenant has been uh, abandoned, lain forgotten and neglected for the previous 20 years. And he goes to the village, brings back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem amid great fanfare. He, the king, dresses in priestly vestments and dances in celebration in front of the Ark. Why? Because inside the ark are the two tablets of stone on which are carved the word of God, the Ten Commandments. The king wants the word of God enthroned at the center of his kingdom, right in his capital, and he rejoices to accomplish it. This is what the bishops are desiring and praying will be accomplished in us through this year of the Word. To go in search of the Word of God, each one of us, to go in search of the Word of God and then joyfully, like King David, to restore it to a place of preeminence in our own hearts. Now that's a big ask for this year of the Word. I, we probably don't feel as joyful as King David dancing in front of the ark every Sunday when the readings are read at Mass, I would guess. And I'm sure there are many reasons for that, but one of them, if I can be blunt, one of the reasons why we're not always so inspired with joy to hear the Word of God is probably because it is difficult for us to understand what the Scriptures are saying. And it's not because the scriptures are written in a complicated style. The language is not com complicated and confusing. In fact, when St. Augustine, in his 20s, decided to take a serious look at Christianity, he went to the scriptures to read them. And he describes how, when he did, he was actually quite disappointed initially, by what he read, because he found the language of the Bible surprisingly ordinary and commonplace, and not at all what he was expecting, which was high uh, oratorical, beautiful, you know, structured phrases like Cicero. It wasn't that at all. So the words of the text are not complicated. But it is often difficult to understand what the words are telling us. What on earth are we supposed to make, for instance, of the bizarre images of the book of Revelation? Dragons with seven heads and ten horns, all of that sort of thing. What are we to make of Lot's wife, who is famously turned to a pillar of salt? The words may not be complicated, but the images are. Even St. Peter, who knew our Lord, the first Pope, even St. Peter, humbly admitted that 
in the scriptural letters of Saint Paul, he says there are some things hard to understand. It's good to know we're in the company of Saint Peter. Now we are familiar, you and I, with with many of the individual stories of the text of Scripture. We're familiar with um, Noah and the Ark. We're familiar with Samson and Delilah. We're familiar with the raising of Lazarus, the conversion of Saint Paul. But, and here's the problem, these stories can very, very easily become disconnected from each other. Read on a Sunday without it being clear how one story relates to the next. It's like looking at the individual pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and not knowing what the whole picture is meant to look like. It's that confusing. So in order to make sense of scripture, we need to recall why God has given it to us at all. Because it isn't a divine puzzle. He's not simply testing and challenging our determination to try and make sense of it. He's not just testing our cleverness and how good a brain we've got. Scripture is a divine dialogue. If he just wanted to give us instructions on how to live, that would be very simple. It's much, much, much more than that. Instead of just giving instructions, he's using the text of Scripture as an instrument in order to reveal himself to you, little by little, story by story, prophecy, poetry, the narration of past events, but through it all, whenever you read any passage of scripture, you need, we all of us need to recall this. God is speaking to you in real time, right now, in that moment, to you. He is trying to reveal himself to you. If he uses ordinary words, commonplace language to do it, it's because that's the kind of language we need. We need simple words. But don't for a second think that just because he does stoop to our level to use simple language, what he's actually going to be communicating is going to be simplistic. It isn't. Holy Scripture is an invitation from God to, for us to immerse ourselves in who God is. That is a mystery of infinite depth. This is what a 4th century deacon from Syria at Ephraim said about the depth of of meaning in Holy Scripture. He said this, Lord, who can grasp all the wealth of just one of your words? What we understand is much less than what we leave behind, like thirsty people who drink from a fountain. He who comes into contact with some share of its treasure should not think that the only thing contained in the word is that which he himself has found. He should realize that he has only been able to find that one thing from among many others. Nor, because only that one part has become his, should he say that the word is void and empty and look down on it. But because he could not exhaust it, he should give thanks for its riches. Be glad that you are overcome, and do not be sad that it overcame you. Beautiful words. Now, we are going to have to do some work to understand and to discover the riches contained in the sacred page. Saint Bede, our own great Saint Bede, he used the gospel account of the apostles, you probably remember, plucking ears of corn on the Sabbath and rubbing them to get at the, at the grain inside. He used that as an image of, of, of reading and praying Holy Scripture because he said that the these nourishing spiritual truths in scripture also lie beneath the surface and not at the superficial level of immediate understanding. So we have to, like the apostles, rub at the sacred text, if you like. So our first step and every step following from that must be soaked in a holy humility before the word of God. We are not masters of the sacred page. We are students before it. 
we are scraping at a treasure that is the, the depth of which is genuinely beyond uh, our imagination. It's inexhaustible because through the Holy Spirit, what we're delving into is the depth of God himself. So to make headway in reading scripture, we are going to need prayerful faith. We can't just rely on being clever people. We're going to need prayerful faith. Like the apostles, uh, when our Lord appears to them after the resurrection, um, is uh, described that uh, uh, Christ opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's what we're going to need. Now, if Christ is going to do that, open our minds to understand his sacred text, what do we need to do? Well, for a start, we need to open the book. <laughs> it has to be familiar before it can be understandable. So we have to start reading it. And since we're mining for sacred treasure, we are going to need special tools in order to dig. Without them, we will be trying to dig with our bare hands, and we will not get very far. Um, use them well, and we will be changed by what we discover in Holy Scripture. So, what tools do we have that help us understand the meaning of, sac of, of sacred Scripture? The first I would give you is this. It's something to remain in the forefront of our minds in whatever text we read in the Bible, and it is this. Scripture is inspired, and that may sound so obvious, but understand what that means. Scripture is unlike any other written text in the world. And we have to read it in its own unique way as a consequence. Think of this. Every single phrase of Holy Scripture, every phrase, there are two authors at work. Each one collaborates actively with the other. There is no friction between them, there is no competition between them, and there is no contradiction between these two authors in any one text. The first is a human author, and the personality of that author is going to come through in the language that is being used. But there is also a divine author at work in every phrase. St. Paul describes scripture, most wonderful expression, he says, it is God-breathed. Scripture is God-breathed. In other words, it originates in him. Not just from the human hand of the human writer who held the pen. Second Vatican Council tells us that whatever the human author affirms is also affirmed simultaneously and without reservation by the Holy Spirit because it's the Spirit who has directly inspired the author to write what he writes. That means every phrase of Scripture is deliberately intended by God as well as by St. Paul or St. John or whoever the human author is. St. Paul says that we should accept it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. So every detail has a divine purpose. Note that, every detail. And no matter how trivial the detail may appear to be, God is using it to say something to us. So take your time over a passage. Notice what appear to be unimportant details, because they aren't unimportant. Take the three months that Our Lady stayed with Elizabeth at the visitation. We're told it's three months. <clears throat> Add them to the six months that Elizabeth has already been carrying her child. <coughs> and Scripture is telling us that Our Lady stayed with Elizabeth up to the point that she gave birth to St. John the Baptist. So consider this. Jesus Christ was present in the womb of Our Lady at the birth of St. John the Baptist the one whom he had sent ahead to prepare the way for him. You see what I mean about it? A little detail. Where Our Lady is, Christ is there too. So that's the first tool. Second tool flows from the first. The unity of sacred scripture. 
there are many different human authors of the different texts, the different books of Holy Scripture, and they use their own phraseology and their own language, but there is a single author behind every single one, from Genesis right the way through to the book of the Apocalypse. This means there is going to be a profound consistency between all the texts of the Bible. It means that whenever we discover what appears to be a contradiction between two texts, or an inconsistency in a text, or an impossibility, or an error, we know, we know, that we are misunderstanding the text because there is one author who is responsible for every single book, so there are no inconsistencies. This is how St. Augustine described it. He speaks of this in about the year 400 AD, and talking about the entire canon of Scripture, he writes of the Bible, of these alone, he says, do I most firmly believe that the authors were completely free from error. And if in these writings I am perplexed by anything which appears to me opposed to truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty, the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said, or I myself have failed to understand it. That's St. Augustine talking a doctor of the church. I myself may have, un have misunderstood it. You see what I mean about sacred humility before the holy text? Now, the unity of scripture means more than just that it's free of errors and contradictions. If one author, God, is behind every book of the Bible, then each book, even each passage, each phrase, is read by us with the whole of the rest of Scripture in mind, not in isolation. One passage will help us to interpret another passage. We will find that phrases get repeated, the more familiar we are with the text. We'll find that events, if not exactly being duplicated, events in Scripture will, will rhyme. Let me give you an example. When our Lord is described by St. John the Baptist as the Lamb of God. Your minds, I'm sure, will already be starting to remember other occasions that refer to a lamb, the Passover lamb, for instance. Isaiah, the prophet, speaking about the lamb that is led to the slaughter as an image of the Redeemer who will come. Now, I'm not going to go into the lamb in any more detail because Father Robbie's going to pick that one up later on. I just mention it to say that's one image that's already familiar to you. But there are other echoes in Scripture that may not be quite so familiar, that are presented delicately, with a great lightness of touch, that have been placed there by God and that we can begin to look out for, because they will tell us. So, for example, you may have noticed, possibly, that the first prophecy of salvation in Holy Scripture, which is given by God in the Garden of Eden, immediately after the fall, Genesis chapter 3, that that prophecy of salvation is fulfilled in a tiny detail in Christ's crucifixion. God tells the serpent, as you remember, that the seed or the son of the woman will crush the head or the skull of the serpent's seed. Now, remember, not one but all four evangelists tell us what would otherwise be a totally trivial detail, that the place where Christ is crucified is called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where the skull of the serpent is crushed. It's just a hint. And if that isn't enough, Christ on the cross himself also delicately hints at the same prophecy. Because in Genesis, we're told that the victor over the serpent, 
the one who crushes the, the, the serpent's head or the serpent's seed's head, will be the seed of the woman. And that title, woman, is exactly how our Lord refers to Our Lady, his own mother, from the cross. Woman, behold your son. It's a reference to Genesis. He's not being rude. We have a seed or a son. We have the mother who is called woman. We have the serpent in the Garden of Eden, ultimately defeated at the place of the skull. Scripture is a single narrative. Genesis relates to the Gospels. No passage is read in isolation, but in relationship to the rest of Holy Scripture. Now we've noticed it, we can start to pick up its resonance in other places in the Bible. So, for instance, when David kills Goliath, the giant, we'll notice that the shepherd boy, David, when he fires his slingshot at the Philistine, Scripture tells us it strikes him in his head, and the text says it, the stone sank into his forehead, literally crushed his skull. You see how the echoes can be delicate, understated, but there. And it points to the day when the son of David, Jesus himself, will crush the head of the champion of evil the serpent of the Garden of Eden. We'll start to see when we begin to recognize these echoes that scripture is a single story, not just a collection of stories that don't relate to each other. We'll see that God has been working towards the coming of Jesus from the very moment of the fall in Genesis. And we'll also see echoes of the enemy at work as well. Again, very subtle. So in the book of Revelation, we're told of the beast, the servant of the devil, in all of his ugliness, very obvious. But then we start to notice that the presence of evil is there in more disguised forms, less obvious ones, earlier on in Holy Scripture, in fact, throughout. To give you an example, we read that King Solomon, the wise king, at the height of his glory, receives tribute payments from the kingdoms that he has defeated. And the text tells us carefully that the amount he receives annually is 666 talents. It's a, an ominous note for anybody who knows the book of Revelation and the number of the beast. It tells us that there is a rottenness, even in someone as great as King, da as King Solomon. And if you go on with the text, immediately afterwards, the text begins to describe King Solomon's catastrophic fall from glory as he raises up altars to pagan gods and begins even the process of child sacrifice. Hints can tell us a lot. Now, we may not be used to reading scripture quite this way, but it was second nature to our Lord. He does it. He uses the image of Moses raising up the serpent in the desert as a way of helping people to understand his own being lifted up on the cross. St. Peter uses it. He uses the flood as a way of describing holy baptism in his first letter. St. Paul uses it all the time, the figure of Adam as a way of describing Christ who founds the new human race, the renewed and perfected human race. The fathers of the church use these, this way of interpreting scripture all the time. So reading the book of Esther, Queen Esther, who goes before the all-powerful king to beg for the liberation and the, the, the uh, uh, mercy on her own people who are under sentence of death, they see that as an image of Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, not of Earth, who prays and begs her divine son, the King, for mercy on sinful mankind. This tool, the unity of Scripture, is very, very important for us to rediscover today. 
It prevents us thinking of the Bible as just unconnected stories. And it helps us to see the continuity of God's plan. He's not making it up as he goes along. So, are we on our own then, just to find quirky echoes and resonances from one end of the scriptures to the other and just make it up as we go along? No. How can we be sure that the meaning we see in the text is not one that we've invented, but the one that God has placed there? Let's have a look at the third, a third tool for the interpretation of scripture. The rule of faith, it's called. It's very simple. Scripture does not exist apart from the church. Scripture is the inspired record of the faith of the church. So we need to be careful to avoid thinking that Scripture means whatever occurs to me at the time. You know, you have your version of Scripture and I have my version and we're both right. It's exactly that way of thinking that St. Peter himself wrote to correct when he writes in his first letter, you must understand this, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one, one's, own, one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. So to put it simply, scripture has its own content, it has its meaning, that it is transmitting, and it is for us to discover what that meaning is, and not to superimpose our own onto it. So this third tool to help us discover the genuine meaning of scripture is the rule of faith. It means we interpret the text through the lens of the church's faith. And we reject as false any interpretation of sacred scripture that contradicts the faith that we have received from the apostles as taught by the church's teaching office, by the bishops. And this is scriptural. We haven't made it up, because scripture itself does not say that scripture is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. Scripture says the church is the pillar and the bulwark of the truth. So to put it the other way around, the church is the guardian of the genuine meaning of scripture. To depart from her teaching is to introduce into the text a meaning that is alien to scripture. So we need to get used to reading the scriptures through the lens of the church's faith. If that sounds difficult, do not be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Because we have been given two particular aids to help us. And I recommend them to you. The work's been done. The first is any copy of the Bible, the whole Bible, make sure it's got all the texts of the Old Testament in it, that also refers you in its notes at the bottom of the page to the Catechism, which is the teaching of the Church. So you can read a text of Scripture and see, cross-reference it with where that text is used in the Catechism. See how the Church understands the text. And the other is, of course, the Catechism itself. Look in the back of the Catechism, you will see pages of references, pages of them, where each individual text of scripture that is quoted in the Catechism is listed with the paragraph where that text is quoted. So if you're reading a text, have a look in the back of the Catechism, see how the church uses that text. Do it for this Sunday, for tomorrow, the Gospel reading for tomorrow. Look it up. See where the Catechism uses and quotes the text of the Samaritan woman, which we're going to hear tomorrow. See how the church understands it. The fourth tool after the rule of faith flows naturally from it, the mind of the church. If scripture is the inspired account of the church's faith, then not only do we interpret scripture through the lens of that faith, but also, and here we have such a, a gift given to us, we use the way the church's greatest and holiest minds throughout the 2,000 years of the church's history has meditated on that text. They spent their lives pondering the sacred text, praying it, discussing it, preaching it. 
Their insights are as true today as they were a thousand years ago. Don't think that just because they lived a long time ago, their understanding is somehow unnecessary or been superseded. Not so. It's easily done, especially nowadays. The prize is the new and tends to look with a little bit of suspicion on the old. That's not how the church thinks. If it was, we'd have ditched Christ a long time ago as being awfully old, 2,000 years old. These words I'm going to read to you come from, from the Vatican Congregation for Catholic Education, talking about the importance of using what the fathers, the great interpreters of the faith, have said about Scripture. They say that many modern biblical interpreters cast a shadow on the contributions of the fathers, who are considered simplistic and basically useless for an in-depth knowledge of sacred Scripture. Instead, the document says, the exegesis, the interpretation, of the fathers could open our eyes to other dimensions of spiritual exegesis. So don't be afraid to ask, how have our great saints understood this passage, this text? And you may be surprised at how accessible they are. I was going to say they don't write in Greek. Actually, they do. <laughs> But they've been translated, so it's all right. Um, the, the sermons of St. Augustine were not written for a symposium of biblical scholars. They were written for people like you and me, the people who attended Mass in the city of Hippo on a Sunday morning. They are amazingly readable. Other great fathers like uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote an amazing book called The Life of Moses. He takes the biblical account of the Red Sea and crossing the wilderness and the manor in the desert and Mount Sinai, all these the stories that we know so well, and uses them as an allegory of the Christian life. We go through the waters of baptism into the desert where we're tempted, where we're tested, and we fall just like they did. And he supports us with manna from heaven, the Eucharist. It's the most beautiful description, and you'll recognize it as being very true to our own experience of being Christian people. Now, there are lots of ways to go about discovering what the fathers have said about Scripture, and one is the Catechism. Quotes the fathers all the time. Have a look. See how they've interpreted the text. And there are other ways of doing it, and there are two that I would suggest to you. In fact, I've put copies on the table in the, the area where we're going to have uh, tea and coffee in a few moments. You can have a look at. The first is, you may have come across the Ignatius Catholic Bible study series. It says you can get them as booklets for each book of the Bible. They're quite short. It gives the text of, of the book of the Bible and then underneath it all kinds of commentary. Quite short. Giving an explanation of a particular text and very often quoting a short quotation. Saint Bede wrote this or Saint Gregory the Great wrote this. Amazingly insightful. The other is that I would suggest to you is the Navarre Bible. It does exactly the same thing. Again, there are copies of the, there's a copy of the, in, the, in the, the porch. Please don't take it away with you because they belong to me <laughs> and I use them. But you can have a look at them. Again, it, it gives references and descriptions of what the fathers have said about a particular book. The fifth tool, and this is the last one I'm going to mention, you will be relieved to hear. The fathers themselves that I've just been talking about, they came to understand that Scripture speaks to us at different levels, leading us to consider the same text in different ways, four different levels, called the four senses of Scripture. I'm just going to mention them to you because they help us to make sense of texts of the Bible. The first sense of Scripture is the literal sense. It points us to the meaning of the words. What do the words mean? So, when the servant owes his master 10,000 talents, we ask the question, what is 10,000 talents? Because when you find out, you will understand the story even more powerfully. It works out as a couple of billion years worth of work. And he says, what does he say? Give me time and I will pay. <laughs> yeah, 
Once you know what the words mean, the text starts to make more sense. They're not just numbers. Are the words that we're reading meant to be taken in a literally literal sense? This is going to sound complicated. By which I mean, for instance, the text tells us that Our Lady gave birth to Jesus at Bethlehem. Is that meant to be taken literally? And we would say, yes. Wouldn't we? <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> and that's clearly meant to be understood as being that's where he was born. Or is a particular text meant to be taken poetically? For instance, the days of creation. Is that literal or is that poetic? You see, we already do it to some degree, make these distinctions and judgments. Is it exaggeration for effect? So when our Lord says, no one can be my disciple unless he hates his father, his mother, his brothers, and his sisters, is that literal? You see, it's his instinctive in some texts. We need to get used to making that distinction in whatever text we read. What is the human author actually trying to tell us? And remember, what the human author is telling us is what the Holy Spirit is affirming. So, for instance, sometimes you have to be quite careful and pause and not just make assumptions. When Our Lady is described, or when Our Lord is described as the firstborn of Son of Mary, the firstborn Son, consider, can we simply assume that that means that there was therefore a second and a third? Our Lady had other children. Is that what the text is telling us? Or does that phrase the firstborn son, have a technical meaning, one that's not obvious, but which is revealed in other texts of the Bible. More about that later. So that's the literal sense. The second of the four senses of scripture is the allegorical, and we sort of had a look at that already, I just didn't tell you that's what we were doing. It means we ask the question, when I read this passage, where do I find similar events, similar language, similar people, similar objects that will help me interpret this text I'm reading? So, for instance, when we read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, as we did in Advent of this year, that St. Joseph, the husband of Mary, receives a number of visions where he is instructed in what he is to do, a man of dreams, Ask yourself the question, where in scripture do I find another Joseph who is a man of dreams? And what will that help me to understand of what's happening with the birth of our Lord? Father Robbie is going to pick up the person of, of, of Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis himself um, later on. Well, think of the creation of Eve in the Garden of Eden. She's taken, a, 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 God takes a rib out of the side of Adam as he lies asleep and, and, and makes his, uh, Adam's bride, Eve, consider it as an allegory of the creation of the church, which is Christ's bride, just as Eve is Adam's bride. The church is formed from the pierced side of Christ on the cross, from which flow blood and water, the sacraments of baptism, and the Eucharist, which draw us into and make us members of the church. And it happens, Adam was asleep in the garden, Christ sleeps in the sleep of death on the cross. It's powerful, isn't it? I wish I could say that was an insight that I came to. <laughs> that comes from a second, second century sermon on the Passion. But it's not just that it's powerful, it, complete, it helps us completely rethink the way we look at the crucifixion. Because now we're thinking of the crucifixion not just as a moment of death, but also as a moment of creation. As Eve was created from the side of Adam, so the church is being created at the moment of the crucifixion. It's a moment of life, not just a moment of dying. I must move quickly because we haven't got much time. The third sense that we can, through which we can understand scripture is the moral sense. And in a way, it's the most obvious. Think of phrases of scripture that tell us how to behave. Here's one from St. Paul to the Colossians. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, compassion, kindness, lowliness, 
meekness, patience, forbearing one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. A very obvious moral teaching. But consider the same question. What does this tell me about how to live my life when reading biblical narrative? Not just obvious instruction. For instance, what can we draw in terms of how I should live my life from the men who lowered the paralytic through the roof into the presence of Jesus for Christ to heal him and more importantly to forgive his sins? Well, what can we morally, in terms of the way we live our lives, draw from, I love this one, the two fish that were presented to our Lord at the feeding of the 5,000? What moral interpretation can we give? This is what St. Bede suggested, and it's beautiful. He said they represent, these two fish given to Jesus, the two gifts that the Christian disciple, you and me, offer to our Lord, to Christ today, for him to use, not for the feeding of 5,000, but for the spread of the gospel and salvation of mankind. He means, by these two gifts we give to Christ, our efforts to fulfill the two great commandments of the law, to love God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Christ receives our poor efforts to fulfill these commandments. Christ blesses them, our prayers, our acts of charity for the sick. He blesses them. He completes them with his divine grace. And then he uses them to accomplish much more than we could ever have imagined from our own prayers, our own sacrifices. In other words, the moral meaning of this text is be generous. Be generous with our Lord. Give to him these two little fish. Our efforts to love God and love our neighbor. And let him multiply them and their effectiveness for the salvation of the world. The last one I'm going to finish on this is the last and the final sense of, of scripture is called the anagogical. Yeah, I'd done this before and I got that kind of a look. So the, <laughs> the what? The anagogical. It's a, it's a Greek verb that means to lift up uh, or, or, or to point out, particularly to lift up. And it refers to interpreting scripture in a way that it lifts up our attention to our heavenly home. Where are we headed? It leads me, when I think anagogically about a particular passage, what does it tell me about heaven? What does it help me to see my eternal destiny as being so that I desire it more, so that I aim for it more, so that it becomes the focus of my life? Let me give you a quick example. Our Lord is often described in the Gospels as being surrounded by a great group of people buzzing around him. Think of the cure of the woman with the hemorrhage, people pressing all around him. Anagogically, what does this tell me about heaven? This is heaven. The king surrounded by what St. Paul describes as this great cloud of witnesses. The angels and the saints in their untold millions. These ones who not only surround Christ, they surround us. They surround us. They pray for us. They encourage us. In other words, once you start to read scripture with heaven in mind, what we find is we develop a greater longing for it, a greater desire for it. Now, I'm going to have to stop in a second. I would recommend, there's a book I put on the table at the back of, of, of the, uh, the, the hall where we can have tea and coffee, by a man called Michael Shea. It's called Making Senses Out of Scripture. I recommend it to you. It's very easy to read. It's written, you know, in, in a nice, easy, flowing way. And it talks about these four senses of Scripture beautifully. It gives much better examples than I could have. I recommend it to you. Please don't take it. I recommend you go to Amazon and buy it, or your local bookshop. Okay, let's finish. The, the, the tools I've mentioned, um, we've used these for 2,000 years. They are tried and they are tested. They work.
we continue to use them because they are that effective in opening our minds to understand the Word of God and helping us to mine into the treasures of the faith. When we do use them, we will discover that the te sacred text is not fossilized language. It is alive and active, to quote the letter to the Hebrews. And we will begin to experience the power of the Word of God. And this is how it's described, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So I would say to you, don't wait till tomorrow. Uh, pick up these tools and start digging today. <laughs>